Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third of our First at Home presentations for 2024. Thank you for joining us. My name is Alison Strauss, and I am the director of the Hippodrome Silent Film Festival and the programmer of the Hippodrome Year Round. Uh, now, as usual, we're going to start off with a bit of housekeeping before we get properly underway. Subtitles are available by clicking the CC icon in the YouTube video player. And if you're joining this presentation for the online premiere, you can submit questions or comments in the chat box. Our speaker, Bryony, has kindly agreed to watch along as this talk goes live and so will endeavour to respond to any messages in the chat throughout the presentation. So keep an eye on the comments to, to take part. So time for the big event. It has been commented upon that HipFest punches well above its weight. And I think because for a relatively wee festival in a single screen cinema, we managed to pull together a really full program of features, special events and activities. But there's really never quite enough space for all the things that we'd like to share with you, which is one of the reasons this ingenious online malarkey makes me so happy. We get to pack in even more treats and plus we don't need to be restricted to the bijou size of the Hippodrome. Now, when I last looked, we'd had nearly 450 people viewing our online Francis Marion talk. Um, and that's nearly double the capacity of the cinema. And I should say that's double the present day capacity because when Louis Dixon first opened the doors for his magnificent picture palace in 1912, there was apparently seating for about a thousand people. And I know people were thought to be smaller in stature back then, but even so he must've crammed them in like sardines. The, the Hippodrome, as I'm sure many of you will know, is officially the first purpose-built cinema in Scotland, but we do know that moving pictures would have been presented publicly in other venues well before then. Dixon himself was a self-proclaimed cinematographer, I can't say it, cinematographist, from at least 1906, when the telephone directory places him in Comedy Bank, Edinburgh and he became official cinematographer of the Edinburgh World Exhibition in 1908. Uh, Louis was born in 1880 and would have been just 20 years old when the Victorian age gave way to the Edwardian era. And one can just imagine the excitement the young man felt growing up in the last two decades of Queen Victoria's reign at the same time as the cinematograph itself was coming of age. Now, to talk about this revolutionary period in the development of, cin of the cinema industry and the fascinating stories surrounding the very beginnings of form in Britain, it gives me tremendous pride to introduce Bryony Dixon, curator of silent film at the British Film Institute National Archive and author of a new book on the story of Victorian film. Bryony has prepared some lovely clips and images to share with us, and we're lucky enough to have accompaniment provided for uh, some of the clips by the brilliant silent film musician, John Sweeney. Now I'm just going to turn off my camera and hand over to our speaker. Welcome, Bryony. Hello, thank you. And uh, very good to be here. Okay, I'm going to now switch to our images and um, just say hello and welcome to the wonderful world of Victorian film and I'm here to talk about my new book the story of Victorian film. Well I've called this talk a new look at some old film because although it's an area that's been written about extensively in former decades we're going to look at it in a slightly new way. So the book is part of a wider piece of work that started as uh, part of the Unlocking Film Heritage Digitization Programme, which was a lottery public project at the BNBI National Archive. And as part of this project, we decided to digitize all of our earliest films. So those are the films that intersect with the last years of Queen Victorian's reign. There are about 500 or so short films uh, made in Britain that survive in our collection and are available for free on the Envi player. So the book is mainly a guide to the films that we can all now see, um, which constitutes roughly 20% of all, all the films that were made. So 20% is the survival rate of films from that era. 
Well, from my point of view as a film archivist, you know, what I most wanted to do was to improve the quality of the films available for people to look at and study. Our threshold for acceptable quality of images has been significantly raised in the last two decades. So it felt necessary uh, for me to get as much quality from the films as possible. So we went back to uh, the films themselves, uh, instead of copying from videotape or anything like that. So we went all the way back to the originals to get the kind of quality that we would associate with Victorian photography. Now, as you know, early film is often in poor shape, or films have nearly always lost their beginnings and their endings. And uh, this is due to things like projection and, or handling wear and tear. Nitrate also decomposes, and uh, so quite often the, the films are in, in rough shape. So the quality of the image, what is left to us, is important if we're going to be able to see those little details that tell us so much about our social history. We really need to see the faces, read the billboards and all the rest of the sort of detail in the image. So let's have a look at a couple of examples so we can see the dis difference in quality between a film from the 1890s but made in the 1990s, transferred in the 1990s. So here we have the launch of the Worthing Lifeboat, filmed by WKL Dixon in 1898 and transferred by the BFI in the 1990s. So this is what we call a telecine of a 35 millimeter print. Now you can see that it's a little unsteady and the picture is quite dark. So if we now look at the same film, transferred from a 68 millimeter print using modern digital technique, you can see that the quality of the image is vastly superior. It's much steadier and you can really, really see the detail. And in this particular film, it's quite uh, important to see these details. So what we have is a demonstration of life-saving techniques by the lifeboat crew. If you look in the bottom left-hand corner, they're trying to do um, resuscitation techniques and they're just looking at the cameraman now and he's saying, you're out of shot, pull him back into shot. So you get a real sense of the actual filmmaking as it happens. So this is the kind of detail that you can get when you restore the film and get that little bit of extra detail. So when it came to uh, structuring the book, I tried to find a way to make this large body of material comprehensible and to try and work out why filmmakers chose to make the kinds of films that they did, and if that changed over time. So I changed quality focus on what the films are rather than what they are not. Early films can sometimes be seen as a linear project progression of development along as primitive. Compared to modern films at the other end of that process of development, it's sometimes a bit crude. They were short. Uh, they couldn't really tell a very well rounded narrative. They had no sound. And all along more in terms of documentary, they're not. So um, it's very difficult to get a sense of uh, the moment uh, in terms of news. You know, they weren't always very immediate because filmmaking was difficult. And they didn't show things that historians really want to know. Now, in the mid 20th century, this is understandable when cinema and television were the dominant moving images. But now that we look at media differently, and our, we can see them in a slightly different way. So we've now got a proliferation of digital formats and platforms, and all, which have been produced by digital technology. So you can look at a Victorian film 
in terms of something like, for example, TikTok, yeah. or genuinely call it TikTok, yeah. they're short, they're designed to make an immediate impact, and they can be any kind of genre you like. Sound is not an integral element. You can add it or not. You can add commentary, titles, uh, music, whatever. Um, and they are really based on novelty. That's the thing that kind of drives them. So there's a state of constant change and they're subject to fads and fashions. And this is very, very true of Victorian film. So if you think of it in those terms, it's easier to get your head around them than thinking of them as a kind of proto feature film. Of course, we should never get carried away with modern parallels. Um, it underplays the difficulty, I think, of but trying to make films in that mechanical era. It was um, really quite tough to do. So it definitely feels like looking back to earlier films from the perspective of cinema, history is not particularly helpful. So it seemed to me better to try and change the direction of travel and to look at early film facing forwards to try and experience it against the thermometer his deeds all the time. The great thing about Victorian film is it's a period of great useful energy. It's got invention, experimentation, and most of the filmmakers are quite young. Many of them were very knowledgeable about film photography, which we knew could be an incredibly high standard in the Victorian era. Some were engineers, some were showmen, magicians, some were lecturers, entrepreneurs, and one or two were, frankly, pirates. So I thought I would start with reading a quote which you can see before you. This is from a guy called J. Miller Barr, um, who was a fascinating astronomer from Ontario, um, who was writing in Popular Science Monthly in 1897, a new and wonderful field in the realm of photography has lately been opened up to the world. Aided by ingenious devices, the scientific photographers of today are enabled to portray motion in all its varied forms with a realism which impresses the beholder. The busy traffic of city streets, the play of expression on the human countenance, the movement of waves, waterfalls, fleeting clouds. These and many other effects have been depicted upon the screen with equal fidelity before audiences that have seldom failed to show their appreciation of the novel form of entertainment thus provided. I think it means that they clapped. A couple of things arise from this wonderful quote. and um, It's a very good record of the reactions of audiences to the yeah. advent of living pictures. It's a perceptive list of all of the types and future possibilities of the morning form. It also expresses that kind of revolution in our ways of seeing. And he goes on to talk about film as a record, the importance of recording historical events and facts and people. Well, he even goes on to predict that we will need to archive film and then it might uh, be possible quite soon, uh, it wasn't that soon, to introduce sound and colour and stereoscopy. So I was trying to capture something of that excitement, the sort of born going excitement that these filmmakers felt. And I uh, tried to list these different types like Minabar was talking about uh, with all these different types of films. So how the slide you can see is a catalog. It was produced in the 1890s and it lists all of the different types of films that were available. In the very early initial phase when the Lumia brothers came to England and Robert well, Paul showed his first films and Bird's Acres and others, uh, the show was the important thing, the machine, cinematograph, or the animatograph. Uh, but very shortly thereafter, they realised there was a huge demand for film. So the kind of software, if you like. Um, as soon as that happened, it was necessary to publish catalogues 
which had these all the different types of cells that you could buy. So what this does is to sort them out into genres or types of cells. And that's how I have arranged the books. So we have things like actualities and news, topicals and street life, military films, huge numbers of those. There are local films and are more panoramas or travel films, phantom rides where the film's taken from a train or a boat. We've got films about art, and science, trick films, dramas, adaptations of plays and books, and of course, comedies. So let's have a little look at some types of films. Um, showing you another page of this catalog here. These are delightfully kind of Victorian um, things. Um, you'll notice there's a lot of information in these catalogs, but I particularly like on the bottom of the first page, we do not cater to vulgarity. The wear of the snares they're talking about accepting no substitutes. So this is a sort of very commercial business. And you can see that as time goes on, these catalogues get very elaborate. They begin to have um, illustrations, which is very useful for identifying. So we'll start with our first block of films, which is news and actualities. So these are the most important films. These are films or actual events. Here we have a very, very short piece of film, Queen Victoria's Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, then it's Queen Victoria. And there were many, many films of this great event taken by all kinds of different filmmakers. And it records an actual event in real time. And it was three people pretty much going off trip. It happens. Other events such as this, this is the launch of the Oceanic 1900. This is obviously a film people know this event is going to happen, so they send along the cameras to record it happening. And again, it will be in the cinemas very quickly so that people could see this very close to the time in which it was made. This is... Belfast, this is the Holland and Wolf shipmaking yards where the Titanic was made, not too long after this film was made. And this is a wonderful film made by, again, W.K.L. Dixon, and it's one of these large format 68 millimeter films with these funny little light areas you can see is the kind of wear and tear of me surface of the film made by projection equipment. Sports is another very important actuality. So here we have the Australian cricket tourists who come to England. This is ground cricket ground near Cheltenham. And uh, we get a real sense of these Victorian gentlemen want to play cricket. Associated with actuality, so filmed in the open air in the streets, you had to vote film in the open air because uh, the cameras couldn't capture enough light to film indoors. But these um, films were generally taken on the streets. Um, they're known, generally speaking, as popular, so they just films that were Films, you know, at the time well, they happened. This is a really good example of a kind of victor, isn't that? This is sort of Victorian Britain's got talent. These are street children dancing to a barrel. You can see in the back there is a man winding a barrel organ, and the kids have learned this very elaborate dance. Yeah. Pretty good.
This film, in fact, was a copy of a Lumiere film that was made when the Lumiere brothers first came to London. There's a picture of it. Lumiere brothers first came to, to London in February 1896. They also shot the same subject, children dancing in the street to barrel organs. The other great thing about Victorian film is it can record uh, the entertainment forms of the Victorian era itself. So when film first arrived, it was a novelty that was played within the great Victorian popular theatre, the musical. So it naturally took as its subject some of those performers. Here we have the wonderful Dionzo brothers. These are little Canadian acrobats whose specialty, and much in doing this all your life, the specialty is jumping in and out of barrels. And they do it really well. And you can see that they're on a stage with a roll down backdrop. So this has been one of many, many Victorian novelty acts that go to make up the music program. Really quite astonishing. And they toured all over the world with this act. Uh, but here I think they've been recorded at the Palace Theatre, which is on central London. And rather disappointingly, we don't quite get the climax here. You can see where they're going. They're going to jump into the top barrel. I'm happy to say they did make it to the last barrel. Some chem contemporary accounts of the time where we know that they did, in fact, make it to the top barrel. Here's another great example of how the whole of the Victoria project actually improved identification. This was known under the title Gypsy Cow Drama. And it wasn't until I looked at it that I realised that this is a little comedy made by the great Robert Paul Orwell great pioneer filmmakers, um, and it stars this guy called Harry Lamour, who was a slack wire artist. So his specialty in the music hall, when he played all over the country with this act, um, was bouncing up and down on the slack wire. Uh, but what's really great for me is the fact that this is R.W. Paul himself with Ellen and his wife, who are performing in the back garden house with Harry Lamar was like one of our artists. So we make uh, great discoveries. The other thing that the Victorians did was sound, unbelievably synchronized sound. That was the great Lil Hawthorne singing her signature song, Kitty Mahone. That is as near as you will ever get to seeing a genuine Victorian musical performance. Uh, she is singing, lip syncing to a gramophone record that she recorded for her signature song, and uh, they synchronized it to the little film. Very clever. So the other thing that um, is very prevalent in Victorian film 
film, these panoramas and phantom rides. So these are uh, films that have been taken from moving vehicles, trains, trams, boats, uh, and they also occasionally um, introduce colour. So here we have a wonderful film panorama shot at Conway Castle in 1899. So this is North Wales, and they have found colour to this film. So not only do you get a sense of this rather gentle ride, but you also get uh, some of the fabulous colour. And this has been coloured in frame by frame by frame, hence the slightly wobbly nature of it. And this is a rather leisurely ride um, along this railway, but there were other uh, phantom rides that went at a slightly more accelerated pace. And here we move on to the Irish Mail. So this is the same train, in fact, the Irish Mail that goes from Euston and travels all the way up to Hollyhead, uh, where you get the ferry over to Ireland. This is taken again by our friend W.K.L. Dixon. He made a, a lot of these train films um, and just proves that it was incredibly difficult to make these films. So this took many goes to, to get this right. If you think about where the camera is, the camera is on another train. So we're moving along. We've got two trains rolling around, along parallel tracks. So he's filming this train from the other one. Imagine the difficulty of setting that up and on uh, what it does and just to show this. They were powering this train carrying along. And if you look in the bottom left of the floor, you can see a trough of water. So what this film is doing is showing the train picking up water as it travels along. So it loses no time in getting you from one end of your journey to the other. It's a fabulous feeling of speed. Here's a slightly more leisurely phantom ride. So we're in Venice and we're all on a boat with our friend W.K.L. Dixon again. This is one of these films restored from this large format film. And it's wonderful to be able to see this scene, which looks almost identical now. If you've been to Venice, to this location, you will know that it looks almost identical, the buildings at any rate. And here we have W.K.L. Dixon himself in the white suit, feeding pigeons in St. Mark's Square. And then we don't quite know who this little girl is. She must have been. She's the daughter of a friend. We're not quite sure. But um, it tells you something that we know the hard way about animals and small children. So he's tried to persuade us to come back into the picture. A really important part of Victorian film, uh, and a huge percentage of the films that were made, wow. um, they're nearly all non-fiction films, but military films were incredibly important. These are of all different types. You see troops, you know, parading in the streets. You see them at royal functions, all oh, wow. around Queen Victoria herself. And of course, right in the middle of it, this period, and um, the 1890s, 1899 is when the Boer War happened. So we get a uh, lot of films of the Boer War. Dixon took his biograph camera down to South Africa and he shot these films 
And while you don't see what you would expect to see, kind of what we now think of as sort of battle footage, but this is shot during an actual battle. He describes in his book, Bergroft in Battle, uh, he describes this scene where you can see all the clouds of dust coming up from the guns. And in this long shot, I think this room shows the beauty of Victorian photography come to life in a film. So you've got a beautifully composed shot with foreground, mid-ground, background. Right on the horizon there, you can see Spine and Cop, which is where this big battle was just taking place. The British had lost badly and snaking all the way through the mid-ground and into the foreground of the ambulances bringing the wounded back from the battle. So it's a quite a grim scene, in fact. Um, it was a terrible defeat for the Brits, and it was all captured on the film. So people would have gone to the music hall, and they would have seen these films. Um, and although there was a lot of jingoism and patriotism, there was also... Um, you know, some of the sense of what it was really like at all in South Africa. Local film, very important part of um, the film of this era. This is where local uh, filmmakers and fairground showmen would go to a place um, such as a factory and they would film people coming out of the factory gate, probably, you know, at lunchtime to get the best light. And they'd get as many people as they could in the film and hand out handbills to say, come and see yourself at the local fairgrounds or come and see yourself and your friends on the screen. They were very, very popular for quite a short period of time. So from about 1899, sneaking into 1901, there are lots and lots and lots of these uh, films where you can see people in all kinds of places and different professions bursting out of factories or going on you know, holidays to the seaside. This is the uh, Gilroy Jute Works in Dundee in 1901. And you get a real sense of real people here and you can endlessly watch sort of look at different faces and different types of behavior and what they're wearing you know how the youngsters behave as opposed to the older workers everybody's wearing a hat these are really wonderful wonderful films And nice to see the working classes, not just the, the posh people. So another kind of film um, that filmmakers were, were trying very hard to uh, always come up with something novel and new. Uh, so one thing that they could do was to record things that you couldn't have seen before film was invented. So. There are things like shots down microscopes. There are shots that shots all of the natural phenomena. Uh, and this was a newly discovered film, um, courtesy of the Royal Astronomical Society. As we were doing the project, people would say, a sort of volunteer, other bits of information, these different collections. This is a quite extraordinary film, filmed by the Son of magician Neville Maskelyne, also called Neville Maskelyne. It's of a total eclipse of the sun, filmed from America, all America, in 1900. It's the first eclipse that was successfully filmed, and it revealed many important things that you could formerly only see through sequential photographs. It is a sequential photograph, effectively, but to see these 
thing to move my is it's incredible. And it shows some of the phenomena that you associate with the eclipse. So you'll see the uh, diamond ring effect there. An extraordinary, extraordinary piece of work. Advertising was another thing that the Victorians were big, big into, and um, so Phil was no exception. It was interesting that audiences were quite fussy, and when they tried to show these advertising films, uh, audiences didn't think they should pay for them. Uh, they showed them the Great Glasgow 1901 exhibition, and uh, people voted with their feet so that they, in fact, the filmmakers then had to supply them for free, which is quite interesting. So audiences uh, know what they know what they want. The picture on the screen is of uh, Jewish whiskey, whiskey of his ancestors, a wonderful film in which the um, ancestors in the paintings come to life and go join their descendant who's drinking with Jewish whiskey. Here is another one, uh, Rudge Whitworth's Bicycles, and it really shows that uh, advertising hasn't changed at all. It's a basic message. This poor man's exhausted because his bicycle is too heavy, you know, and this young lady's going to tell him he should have a Rudge Whitworth, be much lighter, Britain's best bicycle. So he picks it up. Oh, I say that's right, isn't that? And uh, yes, simple message, nicely told. Trick films are another huge thing, uh, which demonstrate how film can do things that previous entertainments could not. They can show you all sorts of wonderful tricks using stop motion and um, some really very clever uh, uses of stop motion. Here, this is Walter Booth, who was working with Robert Paul, and he was a magician and made lots of films. Here you can see he's got a um, mixture between this sort of flat drawing he's doing and this his magic easel, and then it comes to life. And then his living model is requesting extra bits. So she would like some arms, please. Now, now she would like some legs if that's all right. What's great about this particular film Apart from the idea, which is a good one, but actually it's the seamlessness with which the drawing turns into reality. He now provides an extra bit of story, which I think is quite imaginative, in which he is going to draw her something that he thinks that she will like. It's a baby, but she's not having any of it. She's fled. No, thank you very much. Here we have the baby come to life. What's he going to do with it? Maybe he'll offer it to us. We don't want it like that, thank you. Lovely as it is. So, from comedy, uh, we also go to drama. So, we're beginning to move into the world of more familiar films to us anyway, at any rate. So, these are the kinds of films that we will... Um, begin to watch more and more as the time goes on. So, as you say, Victorian films largely dominated about 80 or more percent of all films were non fiction, so actuality, street films, so on and so forth. And I will become, by the end of the period, by 1901, we're just beginning to move um, into an era where. Uh, 
comedies and drama become increasingly prevalent. And this is partly due to the fact that they are beginning to be able to tell a more coherent story. Um, so with little comedies, this is great. You can do little sketches and with little dramas, or you can take multiple scenes and, and put them together into a coherent story. You also get the beginning of continuity editing. So from one shot to another shot, you have a link that makes sense and carries you through. So for our last two films, we have two films made by the great Scottish uh, early film pioneer, James Williamson. James Williamson was born in 1855 in um, and he went to work down on the south coast of England. He had a photographer's shop and he was also big into uh, Latin presentations and he began to make his own films. He was particularly uh, creative and inventive, I think, He's made some of the most interesting Victorian films and I think is probably the first to um, do what we call continuity editing. So we're going to look at two of his films. One is a comedy, one is a drama. The first one is The Big Swallow, which is one of the most famous films from the Victorian era. And in this, there is a man at the seaside being bothered by a a uh, street photographer who wants to take his picture and was going, no, 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 you know, I don't want to have my picture taken. Um, and after a while, the guy persists and he ends up swallowing him alive, which is uh, good. But uh, this is followed by Fire, which is a drama. Um, it was very popular in the Victorian era to make little films, very dramatic films of fire brigades, you know, because there's a great dramatic moment and moving horses and men and what have you. And this particular one has woven a narrative thread around the turnout of the fire brigade. So we have a policeman discovering a burning building and sending to help. The crucial thing about this film is that we see the policeman discovering the burning building and moving, running out of shot and then running into shot outside the fire brigade uh, place. And he was called for help. Out a couple of horses gallop up to fire and the rescue is affected. So it's a very important piece of film because it's the third time that somebody moves out of shot and into a shot in another place, meaning that time is lost, he is in another place, but we haven't had to watch him go all the way down. So it's a wonderful piece of continuity, and it is how film glamour will change film from this point. So after 1901, a Victorian era, film begins to change and become more like the films that we know today. So here we have James Williamson, The Big Swallow, followed by Fire.
Thank you. Thank you so much to Bryony and thanks, of course, to John Sweeney as well. Thank you for helping us to, to rethink how we watch early film and giving us some tools, um, giving us some new vocabulary. I'm going to be using VicTok from henceforth and, and for pointing us towards what to look out for. Um, and also, it's really great to be reminded of how the, of the importance that archivists hold in the, the quality of the image and also to sort of confound that that sort of wrong-headed idea that old film is jerky and scratched and, and you know, poor, poor resolution and so forth and just really showing us, demonstrating how the images would have been watched at the time and what we can what we can learn from them. Um, so, and I love the idea that the book, the story of Victorian film, this can be like a companion piece to your browsing through the BFI player and the free, all the free films that are there. And so, yeah, that's what I'm going to be doing with my copy, definitely. And I think as well, um, maybe people can, you know, extend their exploration and look at the online archives that a lot of the regional um and the online catalogues that a lot of the regional archives have as well. There's so much to discover. And and finally, thanks to all of you at home for joining us. This presentation will remain on the Falkirk Council Leisure and Culture YouTube channel in our HitFest at Home playlist, where you can rewatch at your leisure and explore our growing back catalogue of illustrated talks and Q&As on a host of silent cinema topics from serial queens to canine superstars and if you can't make it to Bonus for our 14th edition, remember that selected films and events will be live streamed direct from the Hippodrome and available to view at home for 48 hours. See you soon. Thank you.